for his webinars around um, outcome measures and performance measures and how grantees can, can track their progress toward um, shared outcomes. My name is Marcia Tonkovich. I'm a subcontractor with ICF, and I have been working for the last year or so with the Choice Neighborhoods Office at HUD to develop outcome measures for the Choice Neighborhoods Program and talk about tracking systems for how grantees can report that progress. I'm joined today by Robin, and Robin, if you want to say a word about yourself. Sure. My name is Robin Sinazal, and I'm a senior manager with ICF International. I've been working for the last five years with ICF around a lot of projects that center on public-private partnerships to address community issues. But prior to coming to ICF, I spent 26 years in local government with the city of Jacksonville, Florida. And today I'm going to give you an example of collective impact project from Jacksonville. Great. Thanks, Robin. And so the way we're going to approach today's webinar is we're going to first talk about a process called collective impact. And we're going to talk about its general content and how it, how it works related to community revitalization. And then we're going to apply that, that concept to choice neighborhoods. And we'll talk about a process for how you could weave a collective impact or a similar type of um, joint effort toward outcomes in um, your choice neighborhoods program. So we, this is, as I mentioned, one in a series of webinars around outcome measures for choice neighborhoods grantees. The goal of all of these webinars has been to help, your, help you as a grantee to organize your community, come together around shared consensus for outcomes and what we're trying to achieve, develop indicators which can measure those shared outcomes to, to figure out how we can quantify and report it, and then be able to track your progress and use data to inform what you're doing and to inform your partners about how you're progressing toward those shared outcomes. As I mentioned, this webinar today um, is around creating that joint partnership and how you come together around those outcomes. Um, Future webinars, and, and all of these are available on the Hub Resource Exchange, will relate to how you actually set up the reporting par partnership, so um, how you come together to decide how the data is going to be collected and, and how you're going to have those agreements with your partners to do the data reporting, and then what kind of a system you want to have, what kind of a, an information technology system or other kind of system you want to put in place to be the mechanism for collecting those measures. So I'm going to turn it over to Robin, who will walk us through the background of what is collective impact and similar types of concepts, and then I'll come back in a little bit and talk about how to apply it in a choice neighborhood context. So Robin, over to you. Thanks, Marcia. So collective impact is really a collaborative process that's structured with common goals and measures. It's one strategy, but it's a popular strategy, and so we're going to kind of talk through what it looks like on the ground. The example that I'm going to use is from the Newtown Success Zone, which was a neighborhood revitalization project in Jacksonville. And what was interesting about this project is it really encompassed elements of promising neighborhoods, Harlem Children's Zone, place-based strategies, and Harvard's complementary learning model. The work was actually started in 2007. And so when the collective impact report came out in 2011, what it really did is just provided a vocabulary for work that had already been being done and reinforced the importance of formalizing the collaborative efforts. And so I think as you hear me talk about this throughout the, the webinar today, you'll, you'll realize that a lot of this stuff is stuff that you've already been doing, but this just kind of gives you a structure and a vocabulary for talking about it. So some of the elements that are needed for collective impact, the influential champion. That could be a community leader that steps up and kind of leads the charge on this. And adequate financial resources it's important to consider how do you leverage existing resources. And that's what we did in Jacksonville, is leveraged existing resources to launch the initial project um, and then prepare for the opportunity to pursue other funding. And there has to be a sense of urgency for change. And that sense of urgency needs to be based on data from that community, not just the idea that we, we feel a sense of urgency, but that there's data that supports that there is a need for whatever it is you're trying to do within that particular community. And the phases are to initiate action, organize for impact, and sustain action and impact. It's so important that whatever you start, you start with the idea of sustainability in mind. Next. So the, the shared outcome process or collective impact process as we talk about it includes these key task areas, defining the needs and community assets, the common agenda, shared measurement systems, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and the backbone support organizations. And we're going to talk through each of these using the example of New 
Newtown. I'll be walking you through these steps, and then Marsha is going to take a deeper dive into details specific to the choice neighborhood work. Next. So when we talk about needs assessment for the Newtown project, we brought together stakeholders, including residents, and I can't stress how important it is to include residents when you're talking about community revitalization. We brought together these stakeholders and the residents to discuss the needs and concerns based on the data available. And when I talk about the data, I mean what are the crime, poverty statistics, all the other data that you might think are important. Um, as indicated on the slide, housing quality, affordability, education, jobs, all of these are things that are very important to consider. And families were to, were participate or excuse me, were invited to participate in focus groups where they were asked about issues like safety, employment, family education, and community. It was really important to get their perspective because sometimes we look at a community and we determine what we think the community is missing. But actually, whenever you talk to residents within that community, you find out that there are other needs that they believe are more urgent and more critical to the success of their family. So it's important to keep that in mind. And you have to have both qualitative and quantitative information as you're looking at this. Next. So then when we think about what are the assets, it's important to know what the assets are in the community. Most of you are familiar with community asset map in some form. They're a common tool, which, and in, it's important in this case to think about beyond just what, what the assets are, but which ones address the real and perceived needs of the community, and how do you align with those needs, um, and also reveal whatever gaps there are that are not being met by these assets that are already in the community. In Newtown, for example, we had the unusual issues facing, we had the usual issues facing distressed communities, but also some resources in place that were unique. And that's another important thing is to identify what's unique in your community. In that particular community, we had the location of Edward Waters, which is an HCBU located right in the middle of that neighborhood. And that became a hub for a lot of the effort that was done after. Again, I'll mention the importance of engaging all the stakeholders in this, the government agencies, including folks like your public works, um, all of your different governmental agencies, your community groups, your faith-based organizations, the families that need to be served, nonprofit agencies, schools, businesses, and universities. Next. So we talked about a common agenda, and the common agenda specific in this community was to target efforts on a specific neighborhood in an effort to insulate and support families dealing with long-term implications of poverty. So in the Jacksonville project, we actually looked at a number of neighborhoods, and we analyzed all of the community assets, we analyzed what the data said, and determined which of those communities had the greatest need, as well as some assets already in place that could help address those needs. Stakeholders have an agenda or a role, and you have to think about how those stakeholders fit with the common agenda. It isn't that you, they give up their own agenda, but their agenda has to feed into the agenda for this community. Partnership groups must be able to agree on what are the primary goals to be addressed. They can disagree on some dimensions of the problem, that's fine, but they need to be able to agree to a level that helps move the project forward, and they need to determine a time frame to be covered by the mission and vision. We've talked um, previously about goals, and goals can be like a three to five year goal. There may also be some low-hanging fruit. So as you're thinking about this common agenda, you may identify some, some things that you could go ahead and do right away. And that's important because it sends the message to the community that you're serious about making change in that community. In the Jacksonville project, for example, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office realized that some of the challenges in this community were informational challenges. Citizens didn't know where to access information. They didn't know who to call when they needed, for example, a pothole patched or an empty lot cleaned. So JSO, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, coordinated information walks where they came out into the community with information on who to contact around these issues. So it helped folks in the community more readily see, first of all, that progress was going to be made, but also address some of the simple things by giving them access to information. And this time frame um, is also important because it helps keep everybody on task and moving in the right direction. Next. So when we talk about a shared measurement system, 
it doesn't mean that everybody has to give up the however they measure data already. Um, different types of activities require different sets of measures, and obtaining agreement on ways to succeed should be measured and reported. Select short list of indicators that participating groups must collect, and then ensure that the indicator is defined and collected in the same way by all the partners, and have a shared reporting process and system. So what we did in the Jacksonville project is we adopted the results-based accountability um, measurements tool. And using this, there are basically three questions that everyone has to be able to answer. How much did we do? How well did we do it? And is anyone better off? So for example, if tutoring were one of the needs in a community, the answers would be, you know, how much did we do? Number of students or mentors? Number of hours? How well did we do it? Number of students with improving grades would be a way, way to measure that. And then is anyone better off? Well, then you could look at the percentage of students promoted to the next grade level as an example. So that's what we mean when we talk about shared measurement systems. It doesn't mean everybody has to measure everything the same way. It just means there has to be a common way of measuring progress across the project. Next. Mutually reinforcing activities are basically talking about how partners with their specific roles based on their unique capabilities and experience, how do those intersect with work being done by other partners as it relates to this project. And you don't need to prescribe what practices each partner must pursue, but you need to ensure this, this organization or group needs to ensure that the work is consistent with the common agenda and everybody is informed by this shared measurement of results. So I mentioned um, property safety, like cleaning empty lots when we talked before. Other types of, of collaborative efforts are education, um, including the, any educational facilities that are within that community, elementary schools, Title I schools, for example. Faith leaders can do things if they're in that community, like offer computer access. For example, in Florida, TANF, applicants can fill out their TANF application online. So having faith leaders that will offer access to computers at the church right in that community allows families to go to the church and apply for TANF without having to worry about transportation and other issues. Also, given that there was this um, college located right in that community, the college was able to offer community meeting space. So the, the governing body for this collective impact effort uh, they chose to use that meeting space and it provided a convenient location right within the community for people to gather and talk about the work. Next. I can't stress enough how important continuous communication is. Um, as we all know, communication helps to develop trust. It also ensures that, that everyone's interests are being considered and that's really what partnership and collaboration are all about, is making sure that there's a win-win, that everyone who's involved is getting what they need out of this partnership. Having regular meetings is key, and creating mechanisms for communicating between meetings is also important. And those mechanisms can be things like a, an email listserv, if you will, where partners are connected via email, and things like notes from the meeting being distributed within a reasonable time following the meeting and that serves two purposes. First of all, it lets people know what went on in the meeting if, for example, they didn't get to make the meeting. But it also can include action items as a reminder to the partners that they have committed to do certain things before the next meeting, for example. It's also important to think of things like newsletters for the community as a way to a simple one-page newsletter that could be available within the community to help the residents of the community know what's going on and be kept in the loop on progress of this project. MOUs, memorandums of understanding, are also hugely important. And they don't have to be very complicated, but just simply a, a memo that outlines responsibilities of all of the partners and what each partner has committed to do. That can also be helpful for some grassroots organizations where perhaps leadership may change. Then the, you can share the, the MOU with the new leadership to say, hey, your organization is already on board with this. We want you to continue. And ensuring that multiple levels of agencies are involved is extremely important. Making sure that you're not just dealing with one individual at one level of an organization, but multiple levels can ensure a succession planning and allow for the work to continue should leadership change. Next. So the backbone support organization, we mentioned earlier that this was one of the important factors. Um, 
in collective impact or similar approaches, they really do require organization and staff to serve as the backbone. This is the who's going to make sure everything keeps moving, who's going to make sure that the, the minutes are being taken from these meetings, that the meetings are being scheduled, that everybody's kept in the loop. It requires a dedicated staff who can take care of these things. And it's not necessarily a full-time job, but you do want to make sure that this is a priority on someone's list. Within Jacksonville, the City of Jacksonville's Children's Commission took the lead and served as the backbone organization for this project, a convener, if you will, bringing together the community leaders and the other partners as part of this project. Ultimately, the project became took on a life of its own, and it now belongs um, as part of Edward Waters, um, the college that's located within that community. But it's really critical to have someone who can take the lead and handle the infrastructure pieces in the beginning. Everything from facilitation to technology to data collection and administrative and logistical support. Hugely important as a backbone. So with that, I'm going to turn you back over to Marsha to talk more specifically how these concepts can work within the work that you're trying to do. Thanks very much, Robin. So we're going to now talk about how we take the concept of collective impact, of working together towards shared outcomes. And I think just to make the point again that Robin made earlier, collective impact is only one of many models. There are lots of different ones out there, and I'm sure that your community may use an adapted or a, you know, adjusted version of any of the models. And so we're suggesting perhaps doing a little bit of research on which one works best for you. Um, but we're going to talk and take those concepts and, and apply them to a choice neighborhood context. So with that, what we're going to do is we're going to take the basic concepts of a shared outcome process and the steps involved in implementing it and talk about how that would happen as you are either moving forward on your choice neighborhoods or similar neighborhood revitalization activities. So we talked earlier about the first step being a set of necessary sort of conditions, that if you don't have these sorts of conditions, it's very hard to then build a collective impact or shared outcomes approach. They're kind of the necessary precursors. So the first one that, that Robin talked about earlier was meeting a champion. And that champion could be a person. It could be an organization. Um, it could be a public entity. Um, it could be a neighborhood group. But the idea is, is there someone who is championing, and, and, or a group of someone, who is championing what you are trying to achieve? Is there someone who is the voice, who is advocating for this change within this community? So who is that champion? And, what role can they play in, in bringing together all these partners toward these shared outcomes? You have to have that champion in order to then really continue to drive this very difficult process of bringing everybody together toward these outcomes. The next is, where is the funding? Right? Because we know that in order to be able to make the changes that we want to make in neighborhoods, we have to have a variety of different types of funding sources to address the different needs. And we'll talk about those different types of needs in just a moment. We need to have at least some beginning of a, of a funding source to be able to do these activities. And so there's both funding for the planning and funding for the sort of coming together of the organization. And then there also needs to be um, funding around the activities that you eventually want to fund. And so we need to have both planning funding and some, some source for paying for the groups to come together um, to pay for the, you know, for um, the products you might, you know, come out of that planning meeting. You know, whatever it might be, um, you need to have the funding for the planning activities. And overall, for the administration and the staffing of the organization, which is going to lead this process. So you need an administrative or organizational funding source as well. The third key question that's necessary before we can begin a, a collective impact or shared outcome process is having a deep understanding of whether the community is behind this change. Is this something that the neighborhood you are working in supports and has come together around? Do you have neighborhood residents and neighborhood leaders involved um, in, in a leadership role in making these changes. Uh, I think Robin mentioned earlier how important it is to include residents um, in the planning process and to have them be the, the foundation of what we're trying to achieve. And so it's very important that what we're trying to do is in line with what those residents seek to, seek to have happen in the neighborhood. So assuming you've got those necessary background conditions, and I would imagine most uh, choice neighborhood grantees do, the next step is then to figure out, OK, so what are we going to focus on? Uh, because our communities are all different. And while we might all share some common needs, we probably all need housing rehabilitation. We may all need um, you know, educational support, for example. They're going to be in different, different varieties. They're going to have different specific issues. And in some communities, one issue will be more important than another. So we think it's very important as part of this collective impact process 
to really ground yourself in a detailed understanding of what's going on in this neighborhood and what are the things which are more important than others to try to achieve first or to try to address. And there are a lot of great data sources out there to help you to figure that out. Um, there's HUD CPD maps, and if you haven't gone on and used that, uh, you can see the, the uh, web address on the slide. Those maps enable you to really go down to the census block group level and really map out um, data about the income of the area and housing in the area and all the different attributes of the area that could be found in census data. Similarly, there is census data, and, and census data has um, a lot of information about the incomes in, in, in the area, the levels of employment, um, the types of businesses and so forth. So you know, you want to go down and you want to look at that census data, um, the American Community Survey data, which it comes out periodically, and you can get a good picture of what's at least over the last couple of years true about that neighborhood. You also want to talk to partners, um, because you may have partners who are working on specific issues in this neighborhood and really know even more um, than these national sources. They might have some more local information um, about what's going on with education in the neighborhood or with crime in the neighborhood. Um, so you want to gather whatever data they might have. Census also does have some good economic data about um, employment levels and things like that in neighborhoods, which will give you a good sense of the economic climate that's going to be part, probably part of your strategy for this neighborhood. Also, um, you know, if you have a local community college, if you have a local university, I think Robin mentioned that a university was a major part of her work in Jacksonville. This has been true of a lot of the communities who are existing choice neighborhoods, implementation grantees, where we have a, a, a local university, a local community college, who plays a significant role. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that. Those colleges or universities often have um, good data sources about the communities they work in. So you might try to see what kind of data they can, they can provide. And then finally, you may want to consider doing a survey of residents if you have not already done so, to ask those residents what they feel are the greatest needs in their community. You know, are they more concerned about crime and education? Or is it more about the available services? Or is it about the lack of local businesses? Or maybe it's all of those things. But getting a sense of sort of where residents feel that emphasis should be placed and what the biggest issues they face are is a critical element of getting a good needs assessment of where do we currently so your next step is then to say, okay, if I know what my needs are and I've got a really good picture of what's happening in my, in my, in my targeted neighborhood, who should my partners be? And we really have to think about a broad brush, you know, wide range of partners to contribute to all those different aspects. Because as, as Robin mentioned earlier, the idea behind collective impact or shared outcomes is that we have a variety of partners, each of whom have a different set of, of expertise, who come together, bring that expertise to the table, and jointly agree to work toward a shared a shared goal. And so obviously there's some, some partners that you probably have already thought about that you are, that you have probably already put in place, but um, there are others that you might want to add into the partnership. So your local housing authority or your community development department within your city is, is an important partner um, in the process and probably is one or ones that are already a part of your of your action. Your school district, you probably also thought of it. You know, we, we know that education is an important component of community revitalization. And so your, your, your local school district and potentially the local schools, if you do have any schools in your target neighborhood, those actual principals and others in those schools could be important partners as well. Uh, social service agencies. So this could be public. They also could be nonprofit. Um, but we're talking about agencies who do everything from housing counseling, um, to job training, to uh, budgeting assistance for families, um, substance abuse counseling, whatever other kinds of social support services are important in this neighborhood. And so you want to bring in both those public and those nonprofit organizations who are working in those, in those important areas you've identified. If your city has an economic development authority, and it may be public, it may be quasi-public um, economic development department perhaps, that might be a partner you hadn't yet thought of, but would be an important contribution probably. If assuming that you know commercial revitalization of the neighborhood or job creation in the neighborhood or job creation for neighborhood residents is, an, is a part of your strategy, is a, is a part of what you're, the issues that you're trying to address. We mentioned earlier universities, colleges, community colleges, um, trade schools in the, in the neighborhood, bringing together those educational institutions who can bring um, not only expertise, but also you know, oftentimes we've seen students um, from those universities who play a role um, in whether it's in the data collection as part of measuring outcomes or whether it's, you know, in a volunteering role. Um, universities can play an important partnership. 
we've mentioned residents and resident organizations. Critical element. They have to be a part of your partnership. We need to make sure that whatever strategy we come up with and however we identify next steps, the residents are at the forefront of ensuring that what we're doing is what they need and what they're looking for. Faith-based leaders. Uh, in many communities, uh, faith-based leaders are an important, important component of the strategy um, for, for addressing that community. And the folks of different faiths um, within, your, within your neighborhood you want to have represented as part of your approach. You may have housing developers um, who are active in that neighborhood. They could be nonprofit developers, like community housing development organizations, um, CHOTOs, uh, but they could be other kinds of housing developers as well who are active, perhaps even partnering with you on other kinds of rehabilitation or reno renovation activities in that neighborhood. And they'll bring an important, um, important perspective to the process. Your local police department, and if you do have any neighborhood policing, those neighborhood-based um, uh, substations or others in your neighborhood. And finally, neighborhood businesses. Uh, you know, you, you want them to be a part. If they're going to be hopefully hiring additional people, if they're going to be part of any kind of streetscaping or other public improvements, and they also have an important say in the health and vitality of the neighborhood. So you want to bring together some combination of all of those types of partners, and you may have others in your community that are specific to where you're focusing. So then you, once you've decided who all those partners are, and you've reached out to them, and you've engaged their interest in participating, the next step is then to make a decision about who is going to act as the facilitator of the collective impact process. So that's not necessarily the organization who's going to manage the grant. It's not necessarily the organization who is going to actually do the performance measurement or the data tracking. It's the organization who has the facilitation skills and probably the resources to be able to pull everybody together, facilitate the decision-making process, and kind of act as the organizer of getting your, your team through this process that we're talking about. So it could be the lead grantee, but it could also be somebody like the university or like a, a large nonprofit in your community. Um, or someone who you've contracted with to support your efforts, who will act as that facilitator organizer of the decision-making process. That organization will then, you know, poll your partners and, and your other other members of this process to figure out how often are we going to meet, how are we, you know, we're going to meet in person, are we going to meet on the phone, um, are we going to meet every three weeks, you know, what's our approach to our meeting going to be. So that facilitator will figure out that those logistics. The next step is then to finally get together. And so you've figured out your partners, you've got a good handle on your needs, and now it's time to come together, cement that coalition that we've talked about, and figure out what it is that we're going to go after together. What is our common agenda for this neighborhood? What are our shared goals? So first and foremost, we want to convene those folks and have a conversation around what are we trying to achieve? What, you know, if we told the picture of this neighborhood five years from now, what would that story, what would that story look like? And so one of the things I often, you know, that I did with the Choice Neighborhoods folks at HUD and that I often do with groups in this situation is ask them, you know, write the neighborhood, write the, write the uh, newspaper headline. So what would that headline look like five years from now if you're successful and you've achieved what you intend to achieve? So figure that out. And that then drives the goal. And we are recommending that you come up with somewhere between three and five concrete goals for what you want to have happen in the neighborhood, what you, you know, what you seek to achieve. And, and you can have more, but the concern would be the more goals you get, the more kind of dispersed your, your efforts get, the harder it is to achieve, and the more difficult it is to measure and track. And so usually somewhere between three and five, you know, it's not a, not a precise number, but something in that ballpark is usually the right number of goals. And then under each of those goals, you can have um, a set of outcomes and outcome indicators. So for each goal, we could have three or four different um, outcomes. So we could have a goal around, you know, improving the housing in the in the neighborhood, and there could be an outcome around rehabilitation, and there could be an outcome around home ownership, and there could be an outcome around um, development of new rental units. Let's say. So you want to have um, specific, detailed outcomes that relate to each of those goals. And as our as we go through this process of coming up with these outcomes and these and these goals, we want to work across all of our partners, all of our everybody who's part of this collective process. To ensure that we share, we share those goals. That we all agree that that's that that's a shared consensus, and that we will each contribute our part. And so you might have a goal that is specific, you know, around housing. Maybe that goal is primarily undertaken by the housing authority or the community development department or the nonprofit developers. 
but that's a shared understanding of shared, you know, the other, the other partners agree to that. And maybe there's a different goal that's around community safety, which is primarily undertaken by the police department, but also perhaps the resident organizations with community policing. So you, know, you want to think a little bit about um, how everybody works together toward those shared goals. The next step is then to say, OK, once we've figured out our goals and we've figured out our outcomes, we then need to figure out exactly what it is we're going to measure to prove whether or not we have achieved the goal. Because goals tend to be broad and visionary, as do outcomes. And so we need indicators, which then quantify um, those goals and those, and those outcomes and enable us to track our progress uh, toward that intended outcome. So we need to work together on what those indicators are going to be, because we don't want to have partners on the same goal working together toward the goal, but measuring it in different ways. And so we have to agree to this, a shared set of indicators around each of the outcomes. And again, you can decide how many indicators there are per outcome, but we recommend keeping it to a reasonable number. So we're suggesting somewhere between two and three. Could have a couple of more, depending on the complexity of the outcome. But the idea is that for each of those outcomes, you've got three or four different types of indicators, two or three, that sum up and help tell the story of whether you have achieved that outcome or not. You don't have to start from scratch. Um, there is a set of choice neighborhoods, outcomes, and indicators. And there are indicators associated with a set of a bunch of different outcomes around the people, neighborhoods, housing, and community-based um, outcomes. And so if you haven't seen it, there is a choice neighborhoods metric summary, which I believe is available on the HUD Resource Exchange. You can look at that. And if you don't have it, talk to your HUD uh, colleagues, and they can share it with you. And it will give you an idea of some of the ones that, at least for the implementation program, that HUD is using. Now, as planning grantees or other folks interested in neighborhood revitalization, you're not required to use the implementation grantees indicators. But it's a good first starting point you can use at the beginning. And you can sift among those and choose the ones that make most sense to you. Now, one of the things that we've heard from your colleagues who are implementation grantees um, and from other planning grantees as well is the difficulty in sorting among all the possible um, outcome measures and indicators, that there often are too many, and people if, you know, people have their favorites, and it's difficult to get down to um, three to five outcomes, each of which with two to three indicators per, that we have a hard time getting folks to kind of narrow it down. And so we end up with a really, really big, long list, which in turn makes the outcome process much more difficult to measure. So if that's difficult, one of the things that a facilitator could do is think about some way of trying to build consensus around a smaller number of measures. And there's a couple different ways that people have done this. One way to do it is just simple majority voting, that you could ask your partners through raise of hands, through some sort of dot where you, you know, vote on proposals with sticky dots, but a majority voting kind of a process. And the positive of that is it's very easy, it's very simple can be very visual. People can clearly see where the majority of the group feels. The negative of that is that, particularly if you have a group that's very, that's very split, you know, you'll have half the team or half the group who don't feel like they bought into to where you got, or they don't feel like their voice was heard if you just seem still into voting. So you can try that. That may be a way to go depending on your group. Another way to go is something called the big score, big scorecard. And what that is is rather than majority voting, I can look at all the different options that are in front of me as a, as a part of your group, and I get to rank order first, second, and third what I think are the most important ways to measure the most important outcome. So you can see sort of I think this, this is the best way, the second best way, the third best way. And everybody does that across the options that are on the table. And then you can look and see which proposal got the most first, which one got the most second, which one got the most third. And it gives you a way of kind of looking at where the depth of feeling is and the depth of, of um, of uh, focus across different options. The next way that works that can work well, depending on your group, is what I call "Can you live with it?" voting. And the idea is assign someone from the group. It could be your facilitator organization to put forth an, a suggestion to pull together a set of suggested outcomes, suggested indicators, and put forth that straw man. And then facilitate a conversation around the group about "Can you live with this straw man?" Is this something you can? You know, can you can you agree this is close enough to what you can you can live with? And if not, then make edits to that straw man um, suggestion. And so you kind of start with a basis rather than from scratch, and the group edits it. The last way that you can work, and it, and it is 
certainly the best way of building group consensus um, across the efforts is to have a facilitated conversation and work toward, over time, toward everybody being on the same page, shared 100% consensus across all the partners. It's very difficult to do, particularly if people have entrenched um, perspectives and aren't willing to move off of those perspectives. But it can be done, and it, it requires an iterative set of, of numerous meetings to eventually get everybody on the same page to where we can have 100% consensus on agreeing to what our goals and our indicators will be. All right, the next step. So now we've figured out our goals, we've figured out our indicators. We have to figure out who's going to do what. So who is going to take on what component? Who is going to be responsible for which of the goals, which of the indicators? Who is going to agree to help collect the data? Who is going to provide data to whom? So what are our roles, and what's the timeline of those roles? You know, you're going to go first and do your task first, and then ours will come second. So we need to figure out that very explicit assignment of who's going to do what, and we need to all agree on our respective roles and how we're going to then collaborate together for those shared outcomes. Next, we need to think about, okay, so we know what we're going to do. We know who's going to do it. We need to figure out how we're going to do it. So we need to have, instead of organizing principles and a communication plan, for how we're going to work together. Think of them as sort of the operating procedures for this group, right? So how often are we going to continue to meet? How are we going to continue to meet? Who is going to be part of that? Are we going to have any subcommittees as part of our, our efforts? Um, how is whoever is going to be organizing this process going to communicate with everybody else? Are we going to get a weekly email on status? Are we going to have a, some sort of report that comes out every quarter? So how is it that we're going to inform everybody and keep everybody on the same page? And I think Robin mentioned earlier the importance of ongoing communication, keeping those partners. We need to also think about what do we all agree is the right process for the data collection, the reporting. So is there going to be one central information system that everybody puts information into? Um, is one partner going to take responsibility for all of it and going out to the other partners and collecting the data? Um, are we going to have sort of standardized form that we're all going to use to collect our data? So what's our process? measuring our progress and that we can all agree that we will jointly that we will jointly work for. Finally, we need to figure out which organization is going to provide what Robin earlier called the backbone support. And by this we mean the administrative organization who is going to actually keep the process moving forward. So it's not the same as the facilitator, although it could have been. Um, but it is the administrative or organizational entity who is actually going to um, oversee all the activities that are occurring, to be the connective tissue between all the partners and keep everybody on the same page. Probably will be the lead in terms of the data collection or if not be a liaison to that organization that's agreed to do the data collection um, and sort of be the staff of this entity, of this, of this organization moving forward. So typically it will be the housing authority or the nonprofit um, grantee, but it could be others. And we need to think about kind of who has the existing staff and the, the staff with the right administrative and managerial skills to be able to lead this organization, to lead this process forward? And do they have the funding to be able to pay those staff and to pay for these efforts? And if they don't, or even if they do, what other kinds of in-kind or donated support can we get to help this organization pay to administer these activities? And that might also include coming from some of the partners who are co are part of this process. So if you walk through that process, you'll see that you end up with sort of a shared partner effort toward outcomes, indicators to measure those outcomes, a process for collecting the data, and for communicating the results of what you find. So with that, I'm going to close with just a, a quick note about future webinars, and these are all available or will be available on the HUD Resource Exchange. So we talked a little bit earlier about there being webinars coming, coming up about data partnerships and how you establish the baseline. So how, what is it you're measuring and, and who is, uh, you know, how are we, what are we starting from? And then we talked about the fact that there's going to be a webinar around uh, data collection tools and IT systems and, me and methods so that you can actually track and report the data. And there's a previous webinar already recorded and available on the HUD Resource Exchange around selecting those outcome measures, selecting those indicators. So with that, um, we encourage you to go ahead and reach out to your HUD colleagues, your HUD team coordinator who can help answer any follow-up questions about this webinar. And my email is also available on the slide if you are interested and have questions. Please feel free to email me as well. I'm happy to help you think this through. So with that, I'm Robin. I'll invite you to, to close out and say goodbye for yourself, and then I'll close out the webinar.
Thanks, Marcia, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to join you all today. I look forward to hearing more about the work that you're doing out in your communities. And, and of course, I can be contacted through Marcia if anyone has any specific questions about anything that I said on today's webinar. Thanks, Robin, and thanks for joining us and sharing your experiences. And again, thanks for me. Um, thanks for joining us today. I hope that this webinar has been helpful to you as you move forward toward looking at shared outcomes. And please do feel free to reach out if you have any questions.